Probably my face is the only thing illuminated. Some sense. So, I can't remember if we said we were going to talk about anything specifically this week. Anything Shakespeare-wise or otherwise? Anyone particularly wants to bring up or chat about? Did we all see... Oh, uh, I think we You wanted to talk about... Uh, Two Noble Kinsmen. Two Noble Kinsmen. Oh, yeah, I haven't seen that. Uh, how was it? Yeah, we were going to talk about that. <laughs> That's right. You know, I'm, it has been a busy week. I will leave it at that. How was it? Who has seen Two Noble Kinsmen? I really liked it. It was entertaining. Who did it? I would imagine that. The Globe did it. The, the Globe. Uh, the, the Globe. Is now That's my background. Well, it's Shakespeare appropriate. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. yeah the, uh, I'm at the Globe, guys. The lady that played the daughter. Yes. The lady that played oh, the daughter yes. just was amazing. Mm. Cool, good, yes. cool. That's why I mean that's you want to see great shows if you get the chance at all. Um let's see. So the win oh the winter's tale is coming on this weekend. So the two nobles kinsmen must be on for another couple of days. Uh eighteenth. That'd be Sunday, is it? And after that it's like I think they do put them up on Sundays. And after that, they're doing Merry Wives. So I'll have seen all the comedies. And all I'll have is either five of the histories or three, if you count Henry VI in one big play. Mm -hmm. Good question. Good point. I would, um, I would count them I as really separate plays. Merry Wives, Mary Wives is... For me, somewhat disappointing because I always want more from Falstaff. Sorry? That's fair. Oh. I'll, I only want to count them as three plays, the three plays as one, because then I'm three away from the complete works. <laughs> After Mary Wives. Yeah, count by the hours and you might have a different uh, line up there. Um, yeah, Merry Wives was, uh, I remember seeing it with a guy who had been like a big star in British movies in the 1960s that wouldn't have made it over here. You, uh, some of us around the table, so to speak, have heard of the Carry On movies, yeah? Like Carry On Up the Khyber, Carry On Sergeant, Carry On Camping, Carry On Cleo, no? No. Wow. I always, I always... The Who? British movie ring industry. A bell. None of them ring a bell. So the British movie industry in the 1960s nope. was basically tripartite. There was James Bond, there were the Hammer Hor House of Horror, and then there were these kind of risible sex, uh, risque comedies. You wouldn't even call them sex comedies. Things like Carry On Up the uh, Up the Khyber and all these kind of things, and they're amusing. They're not great, but they're enjoyable, if that makes sense. And so alongside the Carry On movies, there were also, you know, like Carry On Doctor, Carry On Nurse, Carry On Sergeant. There's like 50 of them. And they are, if you grew up in Britain or Ireland, they are part of who you are, if you're my age. Probably not so much anymore. Um, but alongside those, there were also the Doctor uh, movies, which like Doctor at Sea, Doctor This, Doctor at That, and they're all kind of like comedies with uh, risque humor, but not like bad. Um, and they're very much of their time. Uh, Claire, you will be shocked. Gary, Michelle, you probably go, oh, yeah, yeah, that sounds like something the British would have liked. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you'd never make them now, and that's a good thing. Um, but the guy who was the lead in all the Doctor movies, because they had similar casts, the guy who was the lead in all the Doctor movies was a guy called Leslie Phillips, who's kind of like, not quite a great British treasure, but it's like, oh, it's Leslie Phillips! Leslie Phillips is still alive! My God, do you remember he was in the Doctor movies? Yeah, do you remember, do you remember the good one? Like, Doctor at Sea, the only good one. Yeah, that one! Um... <laughs> 
So, and honestly, that is the only good Doctor movie. Um, but yeah, he was uh, Falstaff, and he's short, and he's not particularly bulky. And aside ever from that, you know, the, the dimensions never bother me in a play. But he just, it was a, I found the play disappointing because it didn't, it didn't give me more of the Falstaff I wanted. The Falstaff who kind of knows he's in a play and is <laughs> trapped. But he's going to enjoy himself until, and then there'll be moments of going, yeah, I'm a bit crap, but I must live my life. Yeah, it wasn't that false staff at all. It was somewhat disappointing. Mm-hmm. That and Henry VIII are my least favourite of Shakespeare's plays, I think. Well, I saw um, Kentucky Shakespeare's Othello last weekend. Oh, yeah. It was really the first time that I have seen Othello, so... That, uh, and I didn't read up on it beforehand. Um, I really thought the production was great and hated the story. <laughs> it's, oh, it, it's is, painful. it is very much of its time. Very painful. But Claire? I yeah. Know, I know yes. Claire liked Iago. Um, she mentioned she liked Iago before. <laughs> geez, he's her, he's really her like hero. the character of Iago. Uh, in the time in which the play was written, yeah, Iago would have been very much the hero of the play in some ways. Iago, I like the character of Iago as I enjoy all of Shakespeare's villains. Mm. Thankfully, the others are less racist, but Iago is basically the same character as Don John and the same character as... Um, Richard the Third, and the same character as um, as Edmund and Lear. They're all the same archetypal Shakespeare evil person. Yeah. But I think Iago is the best written. Although Henry, Henry or although Richard the Third might be a tie with Iago for the best realization of that archetype. But I enjoy that archetype in all of its different versions. Yeah. yeah. I, I thought John Huffman played him great because of his... Uh, the insidiousness. Oh, and just his... Well, what's the word I'm looking for? His understatedness, his, his ability mm. to get under the skin and yeah. appear, appear like a friend, and it just drove me nuts. It drove me nuts that, you know, a fellow <laughs> never questioned what he said and wouldn't listen to Desdemona, and she kept trying to talk through it and... <laughs> It just was like I guess the it was just maddening, um, and oh, I guess yeah. people I guess people love to hate it, you know. Uh, it's 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 lasted all this time, and people continue to produce it. Um, but the I guess the mm, what's the word? I guess the simplicity of it, you know that that he never questions. Iago, he he just goes, you know, nuts in his, in his jealousy and all, and uh, you know that just I guess, it made me not like the story for the fact that um, it didn't seem complex, but um, also just the, the the madness of it and just how evil Iago was and was very successful and all that was. I think. It's it's a fairly straight as Shakespeare stories go. It's very straightforward, but the plotting Iago does is quite elaborate and yeah. an awful lot of things working out. Yeah, um, and I, yeah. Oh, I also was just surprised at um, how large a role Amelia was. Mm. Um, Although. I will say, I think that had more to do with Jennifer Pennington's performance than it does the character itself. You think that so? Was, her performance in that role was kind of a revelation for me, because I had read the play, and Amelia didn't stick out to me terribly, but especially when I heard her do the final speech, like, questioning, like, why should you be faithful The men aren't faithful, that speech... I felt I had read it and I had understood it, but I didn't feel like I really understood it until I saw Jennifer Pennington's performance of it. 
Well, and since that was my first I time, another, you know, Jennifer's, go ahead. I think another actress could perform it and it, the character would not seem as important or to take up as much space in the story, if that makes sense. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. She, she did a great job with it. And since it was my first time seeing the show, you know, it struck me that Amelia's character was, um, was so important and was unaware until the last minute and that's how you know how she portrayed that was so desperate and she did yeah she did the best you know she when i say she i mean the character just did the best she could to write things as much as she could at that moment and then iago the evil iago just shuts her up by killing her too mm. <laughs> it was i mean the, uh, amelia Again, may, maybe it's I've had a different upbringing or whatever in terms of seeing the show. But Amelia, for me, is always massively important. There's so few women that normally when you have one, she has something to say. And in one sense, you know, there are other examples of characters who have an overlap. The nurse is the one who comes to mind. But she is, she is very, very important. Without Amelia... Um, there can be no solution or resolution or retribution. Yeah. She's, she's the one there to basically point the finger and say, you, yeah. you did this. <laughs> you are culpable and you must pay. We will find a man to make you pay. Are any of you men? She's yeah. great. No, yes, yeah, so, I mean, and, and you know, as, a, as an audience member, I was just craving that moment to happen. Thank God she finally just, you know, Let's lose. But she lost yeah. her life because of it. It was, she was, yeah. I, I mean, I I sorry, go on. No, you go on, Martin. <laughs> I'm drinking. You, you go on. I really love the casting of this production. I feel like this was one of Kentucky Shakespeare's stronger productions that they've done in the past, even considering the fact that Othello is, in many ways, a problematic script no matter how delicately you go about it. Um, but I, I really love the casting of it. All of the acting was super strong, and I like that they cast Yago and Amelia as older, which is not standard, but I think it worked incredibly well in this case. And the use of Amelia as a soldier, which is also not typical, I was just yeah. like... Yeah. It was an intriguing angle. I mean, that you had literally this one person in the whole on the whole island who was not of the military, uh, and I think it does speak a lot to an American audience in in many ways. There are two things I will have to say about Othello. Number one, my thesis is in terms of Shakespeare's plays, this is not the racism play. The racism play is Merchant of Venice. This is the outsider play because. Eh, yeah, obviously he's black, but we let our 20th century and 21st century views taint that to a degree. All right? How are you doing? And the other thing I will say very much is, you think that there's problematic casting in that regard? So apart from the fact that up until Ira Aldridge in the mid 19th century, it, Othello was almost always him. played by a white guy. Sorry? And after him. Yeah, for quite a while. Right. On its way. Flick it on and I'll bring it up. But uh, there was a production of Othello in Ireland a number of years ago. My sister was doing it for the leave insert. And there was a lot of talk because an American director and actor had come over and he was producing Othello his way. And his name is Ozzy Jones. And basically... He was playing uh, Iago in Othello, which I, I'm not a big fan of a director doing the playing of a major part, but that's, you know, fair enough. But Ozzy Jones is black, and Othello was played as white. And I'm thinking in a country that's pretty uniformly white, taking that one great black uh, non-white role away and putting it in the hands of a white guy who, and I, I would say Othello is arguably 
more sinned against than sinning. That he is played. And the villain of the piece is now black. Is kind of like, um, what message is this sending to Ireland? <laughs> hmm. But it's, a, it's an interesting play. There's a lot of uh, really intricate odd oddities in it. Like the part of Rodrigo, I find fascinating. And I wasn't shocked that they got Greg Malkin to play it. <laughs> I also really love the casting on that. You know, and also the directing and the concept around that character. <laughs> okay, I'll get you a Coke. Uh, His uh, suitcase. Oh. I also oh, yeah. really love the, the casting and like the concept of that character. Mm. Very 70s, for me anyway. Maybe that was 60s over here, I don't know. But he felt very <laughs> uh, bell-bottom flared. Um, no, uh, Rodrigo, even aside from, I mean, it's often an underwritten part. Mike Maloney plays it in the Kenneth Branagh, not directed by Kenneth Branagh, but starring Kenneth Branagh version, which is interesting because I'm a big Mike Maloney fan. And he's played um, Guildenstern or Rosencrantz. I think it's uh, Rosencrantz in the Zeffirelli Hamlet. He's played Laertes in the Branagh Hamlet and in... The, uh, in the bleak midwinter, he plays a guy trying to be ha play Hamlet, uh, but he never gets to actually play Hamlet on film, which I find kind of amusing in many ways. But um, yeah, I mean, small nothingy character like Rodrigo, and there's so much to him. Cassio, Michael Cassio, <clears throat> the biggest, uh, the biggest innocentest man of all time. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry, coronavirus. Um, he is so naive, um, but fascinating. Right, why does, let's run why out and get Michael, Coke. Why right? does Michael Cassio have two names? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. I thought that was odd. Everybody else has one, but then it's Cassio and Michael and Michael Cassio. And it's just like, well, is this, was he named for somebody that was famous in Shakespeare's time? I don't know. <laughs> Possibly. I, I know in growing up, Fellas who had two first names, you know, like Michael John or John Michael or John Joe or uh, Mikey Betts or something like that. They tri by the time by my time a two a double first namer. They were generally taken as a simpleton. Right, I'll be back in a minute. That's how I read it anyway. Um, since Martin's gone, I'll show you guys a surprise. I think this will work. Um, this is this is me at the Globe, and this is me at the oh. Globe. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you're enjoying yourself. I was really, really happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like my other background better, though. Though this one yeah. is more appropriate for Kentucky Shakes. It's it's less boring than the um th than my house. <laughs> So how long ago was that picture when you went to the Globe? Um, that would have been the summer of 2017. Oh, so not that long ago. Not that long ago. I got a scholarship to study in England for three weeks and then spend a week in London. Sweet. That was, I, I took advantage of it to do all of the Shakespeare stuff I could. Well, sure. well of course. I saw, um, in the last two weeks, I saw three different plays while I was studying. I saw really excellent Much Ado About Nothing, um, and I, college at Oxford in the green, and then I saw two plays at Stratford upon Avon, and then when I was in London, I saw two plays my first day there, and I saw two plays at the Globe, and I saw the innovative production of The Tempest that used um, motion capture technology from Andy Serkis's company. Did you guys ever hear about that production? I don't think so. No. It was pretty cool. They couldn't use the visual capture technology, so they had a suit with data information like stored in it, and they used the actor's face to make a to make an avatar, it was kind of like digital puppeteering. The character would appear on the stage, but then when Ariel like changes his form to terrify the 
the Duke's men that are on the island, you would see projected on the stage, like, this terrifying harpy, and when he moved, it moved with him in real time. Ooh. Oh, cool. It was a really cool production. Yeah. yeah. I, I had almost forgotten about it, but then I've been listening to the, um, to the Folger podcasts, and they had one on that production. I was like, wait, this is cool. They have a podcast actually like know about <laughs> are you knitting over there what are you knitting yeah it's a scarf i don't know if you can see the pattern That's a gorgeous it's... color oh yeah wow chunky um yarn so it goes quickly <laughs> and uh <laughs> it's just like knit to pearl too so it makes like a ribbed pattern but I'm working on, if you see what I'm doing down, it's, um, it's a mask I'm uh-huh. working on drawing on. Oh, okay. Customizing, Did basically just doodling. <laughs> yeah, I used a mix of machine and hand sewing on the mask. And I have another one that I'm sewing, if you can see. Um, I wanted to sew something on it, and I was like, what is straight that you can sew? I was like, runes. Runes are straight patterny things that I could sew on here. Um, so I found the runes from The Hobbit mm-hmm. that appear on the mask when you hold it up to the moonlight, and I'm like, I'm just going to put that on there because it's nerdy and looks cool, and it's, <laughs> it's possible to sew it neatly with just straight stitches. Yeah. I, I'm realizing that with the coronavirus, the style of masks is going to just take on an, uh, you know, an unimaginable trajectory, I think. It's just going to be really yeah. interesting to see what people come up with. I'm definitely trying to get out ahead of that. <laughs> it's like, if I'm going to be wearing these every day, especially if I go back to work next month. Exactly. You want to be wearing gonna... something you feel good about. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I have a friend who's a teacher. Or she's actually a teacher's assistant for kindergartners. And so, you know, with little kids, they just don't do very well with looking at people in masks. And so she's made one with a big uh, plastic section right here across her mouth so she can smile and talk to them but she's still completely covered so i think i saw somebody that that had done that saw pictures of that yeah that's very clever smart you know at least the kids can see your mouth and your face more yeah i think that is really smart especially with little kids or people who are hard of hearing right yep So what did you think of Two Noble Kinsmen? I like to say I enjoyed the production immensely. It was very entertaining. Most especially the woman that played the daughter. She absolutely stole the show. She was so good (laughs) and so entertaining and full of energy and just really, uh, she was great. I, uh, it reminded me forcefully of 13-year-olds with, um, like, One Direction. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that kind of obsession is fairly timeless. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was interesting. I, I, If I want to follow along when I'm watching one of these Shakespeare shows, I either go to the MIT site or to Open Source Shakespeare, which I thought had all of the plays. Neither of those sites have two noble kinsmen. Which I thought was interesting. I didn't know if that was because of the shared credit with the, what was it, Fletcher? Uh, Were were they not published in the folio? Or or was it not published in the folio? Two noble kinsmen was not published in the folio. It has the dual attribution. And also for a while, I believe that dual attribution was disputed. I think it's only fairly recently that scholars have agreed, oh no, Shakespeare definitely wrote parts of this. 
I think for a while people were just kind of treating it as Fletcher's play and the Shakespearean attribution was kind of disputed. Ah. Okay. And that's why it's like not always considered part of Shakespeare's works. Hmm. And you guys said that the two noble kinsmen's um, plot is similar to another Shakespeare play that we know of or not? Like, is it at all like Two Gentlemen of Verona or um, the other? It's not super similar to Two Gentlemen of Verona. Um, it has elements of Shakespeare plays and echoes of Shakespeare plays, like the um, jailer's daughter goes mad in a very Ophelia-esque way, only it's a lot more funny and she doesn't die. <laughs> um, yeah. it, it is kind of like a tween girl going obsessive over like One Direction or something. She's like, he's so handsome, he loves me, kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, so the madness was echoes of other Shakespeare plays, and then at the very beginning, there are three queens that come and um, petition. It's also also has echoes of Midsummer Night's Dream in that the couple at the center of at the start and end of Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus and Hippolyta, are also loosely involved in the plot of this one. This is before they get married. So three the actual queen characters. Yes. So characters are in there? Oh. Okay. Three queens um, whose husbands have been killed by Creon. If you are familiar with Antigone, you'll know Creon. Um, these three queens who have lost their kings to him come and petition the king, avenge our husbands. And it feels very much like a good version of the three witches from Macbeth. It's mm -hmm. kind of epic. But then the main story is just two guys fighting over a girl and this other random girl, like, obsessing over one of the guys. Yeah, I mean, the whole plot about Creon, which seems like it's going to be the central plot of the whole story because of the big opening scene about it. And then within a couple of scenes or so, it's like, nobody ever talks about Creon anymore or the fight <laughs> and the re re revenge for the dead kings and all of that stuff is gone. It's just about the two guys and their battle over Amelia. <laughs> huh. Yeah, I kind of, I, I liked the play, but I wanted, I said this last week, and now you might understand it a bit better. The fact that I want to see the play that was kind of hinted at in the first scene. You're saying that all right. <laughs> it, it is. Now you probably understand that a bit better. It's like, I like the play, but I really want to see that first scene playing. <laughs> it is an interesting thing though because you can imagine somebody it's like okay I need you to do act one you do act two you do act three it would be fine it shouldn't be too much of a difficulty and you get act one it's like hmm that's that's nice but that is not what this play is meant to be about John I'll fix it <clears throat> and that's kind of how it was I mean it was writer studio with some of the plays to a large degree I feel like that's, um, it's kind of like the new Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I would, I'm going to suggest that, and I say this as a fan of The Last Jedi in particular, I'm going to suggest that maybe it was a case that, um, at least in Shakespeare's day, it was a case of, okay, so... This has to happen in Act 1, this has to happen in Act 2, this has to happen in Act 3, this has to happen in Act 1, and this has to happen in Act 5, as opposed to, uh, oh, wow, you did that. Well, I was going to do this thing. So I'm going to do this thing. And I'm going to insert three lines to fix what you've done. I don't <laughs> think that's fair either, to be on, on the new Star Wars trilogy. I, I, do, I do really like that. I the last time I I like them. I like all three of the new ones. I don't think they're perfect movies. No. But I also can definitely see, like, this was one director, this is a different director, and now, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, creative I, minds. I mean, I don't think George Lucas knew 50% of what he was uh, setting out to make when he started doing ah, ha, 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 cat. Uh, well, I don't think he knew 50% of what he was going to do when he started making the uh, 
the first one. But I do think he did have an idea what roughly should happen by the end. As opposed to, oh, I've no idea how, how it should end. Let's see what Rian does with it. Oh, well, that's interesting. Colin, your turn. <laughs> oh, no, you, they don't like you, Colin. So I'll take back over again. <laughs> Very strange setup. I mean, <laughs> how, how does that happen? You know? How, how does it get to a place where that kind of messing happens? Maybe it's just me being naive again. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, no, uh, those multi, multi-writer multi plays don't work as well then as, um, or I suppose I should say, it appears that many of those multi-writer uh, writer plays uh, don't hold up as well. But I mean, how, how do we know that Macbeth wasn't, didn't have three writers or whatever? Mm -hmm. I kind of like the, and in some ways they all had multiple writers since Shakespeare was drawing on other sources. There are multiple creative minds that use. I, that is I certainly did just, the case. John just bought Masterclass, or in it, are you guys all familiar with the Masterclass thing? Yeah. You see, there is only one person whose Masterclass you should watch, and it is the most important one. I really want to see the Werner Herzog. <laughs> I have no interest in filmmaking. I want to see Werner Herzog's masterclass. When you shoot I'm, people in the face with a pistol, even a small, small pistol. Oh, he's great. I, 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 don't, I think he can do no wrong. I, I'm a big fan of the West Wing, like a massive fan of the West Wing. Any West Wing fans in here? This is circling back around to Shakespeare, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't really matter. <laughs> Are there, are there Shakespeare, are there um, West Wing fans though? I've heard of it. Uh, I, yeah, I never got into it. Uh, um, to understand why this is awesome, the first four seasons were written by Aaron Sorkin and they were incredible and then Aaron Sorkin left and there are some decent episodes in the last three seasons. Mm. <laughs> um, but basically Aaron Sorkin wrote all of the dialogue but the writer's room was basically let's discuss ideas and plot and I think that functions very very well mm. like getting ideas from a bunch of people and then have it kind of funneled through one person writing those ideas down I think that tends to be a smoother form of collaboration it, yeah. than like you do this p chunk of the play you do this chunk of the play you do this chunk of the play sometimes I think it can work if like one writer's writing the dialogue of one character and one writer's writing the dialogue of another character, I think that's another form of collaboration that can make things go together a bit smoothly. Um, the cool thing in Masterclass is you get to see four random aspiring screenwriters work with Aaron Sorkin and it's like, we're gonna do the West Wing writer's room. Oh, cool. um, imitate it, but they're like, we're gonna s come up with a outline for the teaser in the first act of um, season five, episode one, which was the first episode he didn't write. Oh, wow. The at the end of season four, the president's daughter was captured by kidnappers. And so you're like, so if Aaron, so you basically get to see, oh, so this is how Aaron Sorkin would have finished that storyline and it would have been so much better than how it happened. I want to see it. Uh, that sometimes happens. But I mean, he was busy with writing for 24, wasn't he? No. <laughs> he was busy writing for um, uh, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, which... Oh, is that what he was doing at the time? Yes, that's why he left the last... Whoa. Well, he left the West Wing also because they were like, you're spending a lot of money. And he was like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I really liked that show that studio um, that only lasted one season and then boom it was gone and yeah. I was really into that one I haven't mm. seen it it's the only Sorkin TV show I haven't seen yeah I thought it was good it was you know pretty much like Saturday Night Live but uh, I mean the show itself was about a show that was similar to Saturday Night Live you know sketch comedy kind of a thing oh yeah I remember that one itself, it's, yeah, it was, you know, all the plot lines and characters and stuff going on behind the scenes, and I thought it was interesting. I was disappointed when it only lasted one season. <laughs> yeah. 
I do find it interesting to think about how much writing is going on in writing rooms right now. Most of the writing we consume is written collaboratively. And I think that's probably, judging by my own creative writing process, like I think that would be an easier way to write, to get in a room with people and throw around ideas and kind of let those ideas bounce around and germinate off each other and then be like, okay, we have an outline, now we just have to write the dialogue rather than trying to just like think up ideas in isolation. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I wonder- <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, we, we sort of did what you're talking about, Claire, with uh, 80 Days where Martin would have <laughs> cast in the room and we would talk about all these different ideas and um, then Martin would be the one to write it down for the most part, except for Tori first scene, but that was after we had had a big discussion about, you know, what was going to happen in the first scene. So it was, it was a neat collaboration. I enjoyed it. I really yeah, it enjoy fun. working on de devised collaborative theater. And I wonder how much, how much collaboration there was in Shakespeare's time. Like, cause we know there were some plays that were definitely collaborative, but we don't know if that was the case on most plays or if they like came up with ideas. I've heard it theorized that Shakespeare probably did his writing when he was less busy in the winters when the theaters were closed and he went back to Stratford-upon-Avon, but like maybe even if he wasn't writing collaboratively in those cases, like maybe the, maybe the company sat around talking like, what should the next play be? Oh, we can do this, this, um, old story about this king is like, now wouldn't it be funny if they all just like hung around in a tavern or like, Oh, we can have one guy that does this. <laughs> if you're around a bunch of actors, I bet people might give feedback or ideas for plays. And even so, I really love, I also love working on workshops of plays and actors probably gave some feedback to the drafts they received. Yeah, well, it's, it's speculated that Burbage in many cases decided, I need more lines. But you know, okay, fair enough. But um, you, you can you can imagine fairly comfortably, I'd say, the likes of uh, the major actors of the day, sort of <clears throat> put, putting in demands to have bigger parts. Hmm. Well, certainly, it was the case with um, Ned Allen. Didn't really need to do it because he had Christopher Marlowe, who like understood how to make the most of a, uh, an, a, an actor, as a matter of course. Let's see if I can do that. Um, so I can do that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's intriguing to, to think today how things worked then. And I find it you know, preposterous that it is all that much different to the current writing studios or the writing, um, so what are they called? Writers rooms. Writers rooms. Thank you, yeah. That's what I'm looking for. Um, no, I mean, and we, we, we like to think that Shakespeare is the perfect one. He is clearly, on average, the better writer. But how much of, for example, something like Macbeth? I mean, it's, you were saying it's the Hecate, Hecate bit, the Hecate bit that was uh, passed on? I've heard that part, I've heard that part was probably, scholars think, inserted after Shakespeare's death. Mm. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, I know if I was playing Hecate, I'd have been looking for a bigger part than that. That's for sure. Um, and what's his name? Uh... We know John Fletcher wrote, uh, co-wrote The Tempest with him, which is, if you like, the only original Shakespeare play. Then what does that mean? That all the rest of them have very obvious uh, uh, antecedents. You know, for example, Hamlet was at one point Amleto. And uh, what's the other one? Oh, God, I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Hamlet was Amleto, um, King Lear came from about two different sources, and so on and so forth. So it is... So the, the Tempest is the only one that has a completely original plot? Is that what you mean? So it is hypothesized. 
Now, again, we're getting into conspiracy theory to a degree here. <laughs> if, uh, if that is the only original one, arguably, you know, if, if we're going down the line, of, oh, it's the only original one, we're going into the same territory of, you know that all of, all of Marlowe's works were copied by Shakespeare in some way, and the argument is that The Tempest is basically an updating of Dr. Faustus. Now, I don't buy that because Dr. Faustus is Dr. Faustus, and The Tempest is The Tempest. And yes, there's a man who can wield magic, but that's about it, you know? Unless you, Mephistopheles and Ariel, Ariel aren't the same person, in my book anyway. Your thoughts, Claire? Have you, you've read uh, Faustus, haven't you? Yes, um, many years ago, and I don't remember it very well. <laughs> okay, Claire has left the meeting. Where's the meet, leave the meeting button? It was, uh, uh, it was in my reading a book every three days phase of high school. <laughs> that is a mixed bag, because I've done that thing, and I occasionally still do. Yes, it is. It is. Um, of, so I was reading so much that if I wasn't particularly focused while reading something, you're I going through 50 pages. Yeah, I recognize that. I recognize that. Um, <clears throat> but it also means I knocked off most of the great works of literature that I wanted to read before I hit 20. That's pretty amazing, that's, Claire. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks. The, yeah. Don't get me wrong, there are still many on the list, and after I left high school, it was like, oh, now I get to read, like, in the summer, sometimes. Mm. And the other five books that I left on that list, there are more than five, but say the other five books I left on that list that are sitting on my shelf are still sitting on my shelf. Still haven't gotten all the way through Dracula. Still missing the last few pa the last few chapters of Tess of the Dubervilles. <sighs> so, I have an interesting relationship with Tess that I think might be an educational moment. I've tried three times. Three. I tried five. <laughs> uh, it was actually on my uh, college literature course, and I did not. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it every time I started reading. I think. One time I got in like five, uh, I think the first time I, I got like a good third of the way through and then other shit happened. Like you know, I have the paper on a different book and okay, must put test down. And I tried, I think five times total. And it was about five years after I finished college, I finally got down to a position where I could sit and read it. And it's wonderful. Which book are we talking about? Uh, Tess of the Durbables. Test of the Durbables. Who wrote it? Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy. Okay. Yeah. What it's I've read of it, I've enjoyed. I just always, it's the same thing you said. Like, I would be like, oh, I need to read this other book. Or, oh, I even tried listening to it on audiobook and then lost it. Oh. <laughs> and then nasty. found it again, but it was due at the library. <sighs> well, it was about 10 years. So I must have been in my 30s uh, between starting college and it was a first year course book and finally getting to read it and i got so much more out of those opening chapters than i had done in the previous efforts uh because you know i had more uh, a broader experience of life and um i would thoroughly recommend if you get a chance to uh read it be older um, <laughs> No, I mean, joking aside, I think it's important that I, I, I first read King Lear when I was maybe 16 for school, because, you know, no way I'm reading that show otherwise. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, I, I, I liked the, Ed, the Edmund part, but that was about it. It's like felt irrelevant. And I think about two years later, when I was uh, doing it for exams, I, could, I saw more things in it. It's like, wait, I don't remember that. And um, here I am, a multiplicity of years later, and I find more in it every year. A, uh, I, it, it, I know there are people, I mean, Christopher Lee used to talk about, 
I find it important to read the Lord of the Rings at least once a year while doing tw uh, five to 15 films in that year. It's like, what are you, possibly <laughs> God? Yes, <laughs> that, yes. But um, I don't really do the reading a, bo a, play, a book or a play every year. I mean, Heart of Darkness comes close because that's normally every five, but it's not, not happened in 10 now. But I do think King Lear is a show, I, a play I try to watch once a year uh, in some way, shape or form. Thanks to the internet, it's so easy now. And I get more from it every year. There's plays like Romeo and Juliet, and I, I don't want to say you'll get everything you need out of it when you're a kid, but because then, you know, there's layers and depths. But I find revisiting plays years later can be very rewarding. Revisiting books, or, or arguably with some of the books I've read, visiting them for the first time. You know, I was <laughs> 22 when I read Gatsby first, and I really enjoyed Gatsby. And now I kind of, I, 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 I love the book, but I kind of hate the person. Um, and I know that's gonna change as well. There's so much to uh, a well-written book whatever the culture, whatever the background, um, that you get more as time goes on rather than less. I mean, that I think is the hallmark of a great work. Never mind canon and all that shite. If something can give you more as your world experience, as your life goes on, that is a very good sign. And you know, you get that with Hamlet, Macbeth, Lear, I think Othello as well. And had, apart from, presumably you'd seen it before, Claire, yeah? Othello? Yeah. I had never seen it live. I had mm. seen the version with Lawrence Fishburne, and I had yeah, studied it in one. class. What <laughs> one did you see in class? I had studied it in class. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, like we had read it out of the Riverside Shakespeare and discussed it. I have a very vivid memory of, um, I went right up to time. We had a big discussion about Othello's need for ocular proof. Um, and my professor was a very jolly man, um, who enjoys quoting Shakespeare and just sprinkling that throughout a conversation. Um, mm -hmm. and I went back to our classroom and there like two minutes before our time was up and no one was there. So I, A, freaked out, B, realized he was probably in his office, but in order to let him know that I turned it in on time, I took a picture in the classroom with the finished essay printed out and the clock in the background. <laughs> and then I ran to his office and told him that I had ocular proof. Nice. <laughs> nice. Jay. I would be a, a paternalistic comment coming up, courtesy of the patriarchy. I would be very interested, Claire, in like 10 years time and in 20 years time, how you feel about different plays. Because I find as I get older, my views about what's important in them uh, and what's irrelevant in them change. Now, in the case of uh, Gary and Michelle, am I right in saying that you, who are so only only a few years younger than me, um, this was your first time seeing Othello? I actually did not get to see it. I was busy with family stuff all weekend, and so uh, I didn't see it. I don't know. Is it, is it still available, or have they taken it down, do you think? I'm going to look it up now. I think now. they tend to do weekends. Yeah. They, just, they tend just to do it the weekends, but uh, the rate of uh, stuff that's being put out by the Globe and the, um, oh, what's the name of the bloody place? Stratford? Oh, thank, uh, no, Theater. Stratford aren't showing much. I'm really disappointed that they're not doing a, because uh, they're publicly funded too. Yeah, I met the Stratford Theatre Festival in Canada, which put out Oh, the sorry, I was thinking latest. about the RSC. Yeah, um, uh, I'm sure there will another Othello show pretty soon if it isn't showing up now. Uh, I, I told you that the Globe Theatre's Macbeth from 2013 is up again. 
Mm-hmm. I might need to find that. Yeah, uh, I, I listed it because I thought that was the video that they had up because that was the first one that showed up. But um, let's see what's on Kentucky Shakespeare today. Nah. I'm just really excited. It gone, friends. Really it gone. For the um, Macbeth that I found out is about to be made as soon as we're out of pandemic by one of the Cohen brothers with oh, yes. with um with Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. I'd heard and Brendan Gleason. And that just you, sounds, you told me. What am I saying? I heard I told you this yeah, and last just, night. Like, Big Lebowski is one of my favorite films. Frances McDormand is one of my favorite actresses, and I'm obviously Shakespeare trash, so the fact that that's being made just fills me with endless joy. <laughs> Good. Well, Denzel has a, such a way with Shakespeare. It really do, he really does. I enjoy so, Don Pedro. Hmm, yeah. There's a reason that Branna gets him in. Because, I mean, Branna could... By that point, because of the success of Henry V, Branna could pick whoever he wanted to be in his shows or in his plays. And there's a reason he goes for uh, Keanu. I defend Keanu's role in that movie. I also defend him in that uh, Dracula movie, which I would otherwise not defend in any way, shape or form. It's not a very good movie. But yeah, I mean, I'm interested. I'm intrigued, particularly uh, then in that case. Uh, no sign of it there now at the moment. There are a couple of Othellos online, uh, and I'm sure they'll more show. So Michelle, I found the Lawrence Fishburne film version on YouTube when I was in college. So that's not been too long. But yeah, and that, you, that that film version was pretty good. It's as good a film version as as is. There's no disrespect to either. Is it Orson Welles? Yeah, it's Orson Welles or uh, uh, Laurence Olivier, famously black actors uh, who both play the role in the 50s and the 60s. The 50s, uh, at the risk of badness, the 50s version, the Orson Welles version of Othello isn't bad. It's just, dude, you're not quite black. Um, (laughs) But again, different world and a different culture at that time. Uh, ben Kingsley in about, I think, 1982 played Othello as being sort of more Indian than um, black, uh, than North African, we'll say. You know, depending on how you want to take these things. I mean, he's a Moor. He is, he was, uh, he has lived as a Muslim for much of his life. He is an, a character who has, you know, different angles. And of course, England in that day, you know, the Irish weren't white. We were considered red-skinned. The uh, Italians were considered dark-skinned. The uh, Spanish were considered dark-skinned. We were all wrong because we weren't English. Which is, you know, crazy shit. But, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it is so b- baffling how petty uh, tones and shades can be. But Michelle, as, was this your first time seeing Othello? Yes. Mm-hmm. So as somebody who is maybe, maybe 10 to 15 years younger than me, um, how did you find it? What, what were the things that spoke to you most? What were the aspects of the story that you found spoke to somebody who's clearly in her maybe late 20s? Oh, gosh. Well, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, I kind of, as the story went on, it just, you know, it was ingratiating. (laughs) I just, by the time it was over, I was just like, oh, thank God this is over. (laughs) So, I I mean, I honestly don't think that I would care to see it again, unless it was going to be set in a completely different way or, you know, the directing was going to be done in an in a experimental way or something like that. So, yeah. Taking, um, uh, jumping from the received text, so to speak. 
I, I, I have been drinking gin. I will apologize. <laughs> I liked the the way it was. Um, I didn't really quite get the time period, but I, I did like the uh, the way they set it in a more modern time period with the um, um, the soldier, you know, the uniforms and that's such. And like mm -hmm. Claire mentioned, I liked Amelia being one of the soldiers. Mm. So I've never seen that before. That was it's a powerful. really interesting choice. Mm -hmm. So did you find it, you found it grating, you found it, uh, I, I didn't, you found it tawdry like you, or? Like you, I didn't see it as being the racist play. I really didn't see that. I, like I said, I felt like it was, um, it was pretty simple in that I kept expecting Othello to, you know, check his sources or something, do something, you know, just don't believe yeah. every single thing Iago says. Um, to your demise and your wife's demise and everything else. So that was ingratiating. That was just hard to watch. And toward the end, I started wondering if he was mentally ill because he just couldn't, you know, he couldn't depart from this mm. story, even though there was no proof of it in his, in the way his wife was, you know, acting toward him specifically. Yeah. She was very loving the whole time, and he just chose to believe that she was um, cheating on him. Um, yeah. It is a, a strong cast character flaw that most many men, if not most men, have that we will believe what some guy said over what the woman who we purport to love has said. Well, that and was very true in this story. <laughs> I'll put it that way. But I uh, mean. He, he, it is a show where you do want to shake him. Yes. Not in a, like, you know, Joanne Woodward baby shaking way, but in a, <laughs> listen to what's going on. Yeah, and the sad thing is that he was, he was the victim, you know, he was. Yeah. And so, again, that, that's also just maddening because maybe there was a part of it that's just too real for uh, yeah. A woman's life, a woman who will not be believed just because she's a woman. Um, yeah. and a woman have you who is... seen Winter's Tale? Have I seen it? Uh, have you seen Winter's Tale? I might have, but I can't remember now. Um, I think you might because it's that piece of the storyline is very, very similar to a piece of Winter's Tale storyline. Basically, a guy, a king is told that, like, he gets this idea in his head that his wife is cheating on him and refuses to believe her. Mm -hmm. And his belief basically kills her. Yeah. Or his disbelief basically kills her and their son. And the sad thing is, I have seen people in my life who are victims of domestic violence who go yeah. through the same thing. It's like, their partner gets jealous of them and is like, why don't you love me? But their jealousy, and in some ways, I do think it can lead over into mental illness, makes it hard for the person to love them or feel safe with them. But it, then that hesitation on the part of the other partner leads them to be even more paranoid. Mm. And it kind of escalates it. You don't see that as much with Shakespeare's characters, but you do see that sort of pathological jealousy on the part of um, the king in Winter's Tale and Othello in this play. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think even more so in Winter's Tale, actually. Well, is it, the thing with Winter's Tale is it basically condenses uh, Othello into uh, its first act. Yes. And that's the... It's a romance, and you may have seen it, you may not. I love it. It's coming up on, I can't remember if it's the Globe, Globe. or the National, one Globe. of those. And I'm a big fan. I like the romances. The romances are, the, if you will, they are the mathematical proof that comedy is tragedy plus time. The first act, you, the first act or the first two acts, you get a tragedy. And then 
skip forward 15 years and oh that daughter who has, has now grown up to be a 15 year old woman or 16 year old woman excuse me who is uh, going out on an adventure that she does not know what has happened before and in the winter's ta tale it is it feels like what Ibsen did very well Ibsen would write one play and then years later he would write another play that kind of it isn't the same play but it revisits that ter territory and takes it on a different road and uh, in the case of Arguably, in the case of Pericles, he takes uh, elements of uh, the Merchant of Venice and then jumps forward 15 years. In the case of Winter's Tale, he takes elements of Othello, the jealousy thing. Um, the king can only believe that his wife is having an affair with his best friend, who is, of course, another king, because, you know, kings are like bros. Um, and he accuses her and doesn't believe that his son is his own. And it appears that she dies because of his uh, mistreatment. Don't say anything I'm not else. I'm going to say much more. Sorry? I was like, don't say anything else. Yeah, no, no spoilers. No spoilers. On a 400 year old play, it's your own fault. Um, <laughs> but. Um, it will probably be hard for you to watch the first act, Michelle. <laughs> and I think it is kind of rightfully hard mm -hmm. to We're watch. We've got Winter's Tale now. Yes, yeah. because it hits so hard to that ridiculous jealousy thing. Yeah. That really does happen still today. And is right. And I think really unhealthy. Why it gets to me. And when, when plays are just a little too close to home in some way, and I can't even identify what it was until we were talking about it just now. It's just that. You know, mm. am I crazy? Am I crazy that nobody's listening to me just because I'm a female or uh, whatever it is? Um, Don't worry, it's part of the plan. Uh, no, jokes aside, I mean, it's yeah. And I just, yeah, I just want to say, I also think you guys are very sweet not to ruin it for me on a 400 year old play. <laughs> You're not going to do any spoilers. I, I would first, never tell you about the way they put down the zombie apocalypse at the end. That would be not fair. That would not be fair. No, it would. I mean, oh, sorry, that they may or may not put down the zombie apocalypse at the end. <laughs> Jeez, I've been drinking. I nearly gave the game away. Um, the, uh, but I will say, if you can watch The Winner's Tale, it will probably be hard to watch the first act, but I think overall the play is very lovely and has some very magical moments. Mm. Well, well, I'll look it, forward to seeing it sometime with that. It is a delight. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think more so for women than for men because men do not realize how jealous we can be. And we don't, generally don't suffer the consequences of jealousy in the same way. I have had jealous girlfriends, but I have never been, you know, suffocated. <laughs> Um, have actually been killed by them. Well, no matter how much I asked, they would never suffocate me. Um, <laughs> spoilers. Um, but, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I think Claire's bang on there. I mean, the first act is tough for anybody to watch because it's got that thing that I hate about, that I hate and love about French farces which is that moment when you want to just go, no, stop, let me sort this out. Ten lines and the play is a one act. Um, and yeah, it's, it's infuriating that this, that this happens, I'm trying to avoid giving spoilers. But if you can last that first act, the fourth act is worth all of it. It's a proper pastoral piece. And uh, there's, at some point I must tell you, Claire, that I made an error of judgment in uh, reading The Winter's Tale the first time. It was years before I saw it. After, uh, but the first time I read it, uh, I reinterpreted the ending differently. 
And I don't think I'm giving anything away to say, uh, when I read the ending, I thought, oh, wow, he's dying and seeing what he needs to see rather than this is actually happening in real life. Because that's like, so it was almost as though uh, Shakespeare was transcending into almost a dream sequence. But you know what I mean by this, given yes. what's happening. Yes. Um, rather than the actually, frankly, more impossible ending. Which also is the same ending as Pericles, but hey, <laughs> The first, I, I've, I don't know if I've read Winter's Tale just on the page. I think I may have read part of it in a class. Um, mm -hmm. But the first time I saw it, I saw it a couple times at least when Kentucky Shakespeare did it a couple years ago. And it was an I'm excellent sorry. performance. Um, the woman playing Hermione was just, oh, at one point she let out just this terrible scream and I was like, oh, damn, this is, this is good theater. <laughs> um, and I actually think, um, what's his name? Oh, I know his name. The same actor that played Othello played the Jealous King in that, I believe. Not Dathan, it's, um, Dathan. Oh, Dathan. Yeah. Who am I thinking of? Anyway, yeah. I mean, there, with Shakespeare at, its, at his best, and I personally feel that the problem plays, the romances, are all wonderful plays. With, his, with him at his best, you get led on a merry journey that goes, in contrast to Aristotle's desires, it goes on for years. You know, The Tempest is a romance, and normally, what, what is normally act one is practically prologue. Uh, he skips the usual kind of thing of, this happened years ago, and now we're resolving it much many, many years later. Hmm, sorry. Uh, why would you have fruit in your drink if you're not going to eat it after? <laughs> oh, is that a sangria? Nope, it was a gin and tonic with a little bit of lime, or in my case, a lot of lime. Did it? Uh, those limes must be eaten. But just saying sangria fruit, gotta eat yeah. that. Back to the, the production that you guys saw, that the mm -hmm. Globe did. I've already forgotten the name of it. Something about two gentlemen. Two noble kinsmen. <laughs> two noble kinsmen. <laughs> two noble kinsmen. It's difficult. There's two gentlemen of Verona and two noble kinsmen. <laughs> right. So... Gary said that in the first scene, there is a big sort of a setup, and then there was nothing more about that. And then Claire, I think you said you wanted to see the play that was going to happen based on that. Yes. So I, I want to challenge you to write it. Oh, I've already <laughs> said multiple times that I kind of want to write that play. <laughs> I think you should. I need to do a lot more reading of Antigone. It would be fun to mash up that beginning with Antigone. Okay. Right now I have to finish editing my uh, Midsummer Night's Dream modern queer parody. Ah, yeah. <laughs> finish that. <laughs> I finished the first draft. That would be very it's, timely. It's a one act. It could also potentially be performed, the idea is that it happens on the back porch of a party. So theoretically you could have a performance during quarantine if everyone, if it was performed in the backyard of a house and everyone just brought lawn chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Characters all be six feet apart at all times. That's the difficulty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would not be able to socially distance or safely do that. But if you could get all of the actors tested before the performance there you go. and rehearsals, then you can do it safely. You should have them masked, but use the masks that just go over their eyes. <laughs> or use a complete mask and treat it as something Greek. There you go. Exactly. That is interesting. The idea that we could be doing shows as full Greek things. I've been talking with one of the many, many companies I have involvement with about the prospect of putting a show on in late June. And I go back and forth personally. I think at some point before we have a vaccine, we will be returning 
I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. But how does one go about staging a show before we have an all clear? How does one... Sorry, go on. I've been having a lot of discussions about this as well um, with a group for looking for Lilith, figuring out stuff that we might do um, or if we would need to postpone a show, mm. et cetera, what is possible and with a local playwright trying to potentially come up with an outline of a piece that would be safe to do. Yeah, I mean, that has to be the first priority every time. How can any of these things be done safely? I mean, you've talked about the uh, before cars kind of thing, the sort of the drive-in show, if you like. And I know I'd had ideas like that. The whole idea of doing a sort of a spy thing on a multi-story car park. <laughs> the best bet looking at the science is doing outdoor performances, frankly. Because, you know, the big issue is the droplet to cubic foot of air kind of issue. The more, the smaller, the, the more confined the space, the more chance of you picking up some of these droplets in the air. So outdoors is probably the best bet, but still you need social distance. Um, you know, one of my shows would do great in the Kentucky Shakespeare area right now, you know, because they don't draw more than maybe 40. It, I'm still thinking 80 days is a complete aberration. And, uh, and people I, saying, I don't learn. believe you, Martin, because we had sell-out houses when I, I was know. in production with you. Something went wrong. <laughs> I'm meant to get like six people on a night. Um, but, I've been part of some of the other productions, but they were also often in the dead of winter, and then it randomly snowed the entire time. Yep, that, that was at, one, least at least one show. Can't remember right. which one that was, but... Checkmate was one of them, and I think it also happened with Predators. Checkmate lost a night. Uh, with which one? Creditor Creditors, oh man. So Creditors was a, I was very pre pla uh, pleased with most aspects of that show. I liked the staging, I liked the setup, but we had it on two sides. We had been told that we could no longer use the actual theatre. Because, you know, great. And so I set it up as a traverse or um, a catwalk type thing. We had audience on two sides. And what would happen is, I can't remember if we had a break or not, but people would sit on one side for a while. Uh, it was in December. It was a really cold December. And this was a lobby rather than an actual theater. So people would, on one side, there was a, a radiator that was going full belt. On the other side, there was nothing. So people would either sit for the first, they'd sit for the first act on one side and then they'd swap over. Because if they were sitting in the cold, it was just too cold. And if they were sitting in the heat, it was just too hot. Oh gosh. It was entertaining in that regard. I normally can find a very cold venue if needs be for a show. Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean. I did a show out at Iroquois oh, Amphitheater wow. in October. It was at Halloween and it was so cold that year uh, that, you know, we would be like in blankets and coats and then we would just throw it off and go on stage and do our scene and come up. Uh, that was some serious acting to not shiver yeah. while we were doing that. <laughs> yeah. I, I am acting not freezing cold. That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, I know when uh, Savage Rose did Macbeth, they did it and they had the curtain closed. And the audience was on stage with the cast, which is a lovely feeling. I, I really love shows like that. Yeah. You That's know, a little um, intimate for this time. <laughs> what was the show you were doing? Uh, oh, when I did that show in October, it was uh, Night of the Living Dead. Ah. Uh, really? you know, it, it was the year that stage one had a zombie university for all the zombie lovers in Louisville. And they, wow. had, I know I don't know, they had something like 50 or 60 people that went to classes to develop their own zombie characters and they developed their own like, you know, costume and makeup and everything. And then they, the culmination was that they got to be the zombie chorus in 
the Night of the Living Dead. So. That's pretty damn cool now. Well, that's cool. Which, which company did that? It was uh, stage Michelle, one. Which, yeah. It was stage one. Yeah, it was the only time I ever did anything yeah. was stage one. It was before it, uh, before like the board. How, how long ago are we talking? Huh? How long ago was this? Um, I, I just, I'm surprised that I don't re recall it or didn't hear about it at the time. Yeah, it was probably 2009 or 10, something like that. Oh, that okay. just before I got into theater. That's before I got into, to, into America, <laughs> or Americans for that matter. That's disgusting, I didn't mean that. <laughs> <sighs> that was quite the fun I play. the other way. Got to wear blood packs and got Ooh. killed by my daughter since I was Helen Cooper in the show. And <laughs> That's really cool. Yeah, it was fun. Just a little bit chilly. So we could do things like, you know, vagina monologues. You could just have monologues, basically, where someone comes out and, you know, cats is mostly monologues, right? <laughs> Ooh, cats there's is an mostly excellent... an abomination, so I think you'd be fine. <laughs> There's an excellent monologue play called Woman on Fire that Angela Miller directed a few years back for Bunbury, and I heard all about it in one specific monologue in it, and I bothered her for like a year until she finally remembered to send me the PDF. There you go. Yeah, I mean, she tracked it down, of course. It's a possibility. You can certainly set people in family groups or whatever in the in the audience outside would not be the most difficult thing to separate people. It would be, how do you deal with actors on stage, backstage that, you know, and yeah, scenic folks and all that. How do you keep everybody like that healthy? A play, a playwright, um, Chris Black who did, if you're in the group Valerie set up the, um, my friends do cool things group. Mm -hmm. um, awesome things. Awesome things. My friends he, are awesome. Let's learn from them. Yes. He suggests... That might be one um, of the versions of the title, yes. I, um, <laughs> there was a local playwright who I think is roughly my age in that group that suggested the isolation monologues. Hmm. And, um... Is he the one that's doing, like, songs and poems and stuff? That's the one. As he comes up with them? Yeah. We, um... We've been having a Facebook conversation back and forth, coming up with like an outline for a play that might work. And the idea would be to do it in a parking lot, try and team up with a business so they can sell food curbside and therefore would want to give you their parking lot and draw out six feet of space for people to stand mm -hmm. with chalk so people could see that. And the idea of the story is um, you could do it with three actors largely speaking to the audience, um, acting as two rival healers, one that heals people with, um, through dance and one through music. Oh, cool. And have two actors play those characters in the present that find letters about like their ancestors that have passed on this tradition. So you see these two characters play themselves and their ancestors. And at the end, a third narrator character kind of puts pressure on them like oh we don't believe you we don't believe in your healing etc and then they have to team up but at one point the audience starts with one half the audience starts with one half the audience starts with another and then they switch and then you have to choose which side you want to go to hmm. and then the two awesome. sides come together at the end that sounds great you guys need to get working on that yeah, we, we've just like sort of reached the, wait, wait a second, we have an entire outline for a play. Maybe we should start thinking about writing this. <laughs> Good. But I mean, something like that. I think it's possible. If you were, I think constraints can lend really creative solutions. And I think an outlet, a play like that is both, it speaks to the themes of today without being too damn on the nose. And also would be possible to stage in a way that is, safe for everyone involved that's ultimately the, uh, that is ultimately the thing we all have to be striving for what can we do to make everybody safe and yeah. ultimately if we're not thinking about that we really should not be doing this in my opinion 
But yeah, I mean, I, I do think we, we will have plays going on before we have a full vaccine. My concern is that right now, we do not have the facility to allow for it. We don't have enough hospital spaces. We don't have the masks. We don't have the PPEs. We don't have the tests. Um, so something like what you're talking about is the only risk is really towards the actors. Not or not even actors, obviously, but you know what I mean. Not even not even the actors, depending on how you stage it. If you use an entire parking lot and have basically for the first three sections, it's audience circling around one person who's talking to them from a distance. Yeah. And then they switch, still one person talking from a distance and figure it out so that the interaction, they don't have to touch at any point or even go within six feet of each other during the performance, use the whole space of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing. There's other plays like um, Faith Healer by Brian Friel, which is all monologues. And that's another potential place that you could uh, see a play happening. It's just a case of what speaks to people, what is safe, and what is feasibly rehearsable in the time? We're going to see an awful lot of monologues by Christmas, I have a feeling. <laughs> That's not a bad thing, by the way. Well, it depends on the monologue. In some cases, it will be a bad thing. <laughs> <sighs> Hard to do any socially distanced Shakespeare plays. The only thing I can think of is Kentucky Shakespeare does have two-person play formats, which they tour. And if you have people like the Moppins, they could definitely do that. Yeah, that kind of thing would work. You know, it's a case of, you know, how do we, how do we protect people who are on stage as much as the people who are off? And I think a lot of people are not thinking about the people who are on stage as much as they're thinking about those who aren't. You know, in my opinion, I, I'm, I'm very worried that People are so excited that we can do this and this, the audience will be safe, but they forget that we could be, we need to be safe too. And that's actors as well as non-actors, uh, from my experience. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Shakespeare's going to be a nightmare for that. <laughs> One man plays. There are also, I, um, this fall I worked on, um, it was a one-man play, and it's a fantastic piece. I love it. Um, it was an honor to get to work on it. Um, I came in as a musician and part of the design team, but I think you're also probably going to see more one-person pieces coming out of this, which is, a, which is a format that is pretty well established and that works pretty well. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love the f love flea bag, the play. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't know the play, I know the, um, the film, the TV show. But the TV I, show, also love, but I'd say watch the play that originated it. Um, it's on Amazon right now for $5, um, oh. and it's basically been put up as a fundraiser for freelance artists in Great Britain. Good. Yeah, I saw that. I did see that. It was that, I, sorry, I should say, I saw that that was happening. Um, yeah, I mean, this is an, this is an interesting time. Uh, there's a play called oh God, Via Dolorosa, which David Hare used to perform. He wrote it himself about um, Israel and what was happening there. And that's also another uh, one person show that would work. I think the Laramie Project, if I recall correctly, is a series of monologues. There's not, I don't remember there being any dialogues in it. And that's another one that could potentially have, uh, you know, some effect. Let me see. But yeah, as for Shakespeare, I've seen numerous different versions of Shakespeare's plays, uh, or sorry, Shakespeare's characters brought into sort of monologue-like plays or interactive plays where, you know, Lady Macbeth is trying to teach um, Juliet a little bit of common sense, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, I, I do think this is a good time for innovators. 
I do think an innovative mind, an innovative mind even, uh, is going to thrive. So Martin, what are your thoughts about um, the final, like where, where are you headed for the final um, product of what we're doing with Macbeth? It's hard to say, isn't it? Um, I think for me, a lot of it's about what do we as actors get out of it? Sure. How do we find, how do we find what we need in, in this shop? I think that's for me the big quest. Uh, I'm not as worried about whether the show is 100% successful as I am uh, in finding out are the actors getting what they need at this time from it. Yeah. You know, spoken like a true, eh, I don't give a fuck director. Um, <laughs> well, I really enjoyed the read through. That was fun just doing that. <laughs> it was, oh. wasn't it? Yeah. I did some of the recording, the first bit of recording there today, and that was a lot of fun. Um, I saw Morgan's makeup at a uh, suffrage meeting, and it looked nice. She was on it, I can tell you that for nothing. Uh, <laughs> but, she, but, you know, it, it was a lot of fun today. We had a, we had a good buzz. Um, I think all of them involved enjoyed themselves. I think we... We hit, we hit we hit a number of truths that that I wanted us to hit, you know. Uh, I got the I, I saw the characters, I enjoyed and felt the characters. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a positive day at the office in, mm -hmm. for me in that regard anyway. Nice.